There's an old joke about a father who is trying to teach his daughter manners. When one of her friend's pets passed away, he reminded his daughter to tell her friend that she was sorry. The young girl replied, why? I didn't kill it. I've been thinking a lot lately about apologies and repentance. This year we've seen many apologies from celebrities, from politicians, from companies, and many of them left us wondering if they really understood what it meant to say I'm sorry, to regret what it was that they had done. On the other hand, like the child in the joke, I've been wondering myself about apologies that are not necessary. The apologies people offer because they feel that they must, simply because they're afraid of the consequences if they don't, even though they've really committed no wrong. There was an interesting piece in the Washington Post this week by Mark Oppenheimer about the legacy of the great children's author, Roald Dahl. He wrote many well-known books, Fantastic Mr. Fox, James and the Giant Peach, and of course, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And just like countless other children, I grew up reading his stories, dreaming about the fantastical worlds he created with his mind. And like many, I was deeply disappointed when I grew up, when I learned that besides being a phenomenal storyteller, he was also an anti-Semite. Despite the years of historical amnesia that seemed to take place, more and more his views and statements on Jewish people have become part of public discourse. Strangely, despite that, even today many are unfamiliar with his controversial feelings. Despite that he never really hid them, he was quite open. He's publicly on record musing that there's a trait in the Jewish character that does provoke animosity. In another interview, he stated that there's always a reason why anti-anything crops up. Even a stinker like Hitler didn't just pick on them for no reason. Roald Dahl was an anti-Semite. But that wasn't the interesting part of this article. What received my attention was that his estate had recently released a statement offering remorse for his bigoted views and comments. And again, that isn't entirely what caught my eye. Instead, it was the position of the, author's art, the article's author. Mark Oppenheimer explained that in his view, such an apology was not necessary. He asserts that Dahl's descendants had no part and therefore no responsibility for his statements and views. Jewish tradition is actually rather clear on this point. One is not punished for the sins of their parents and the generations that come before them. In Devarim, the Torah teaches that parents shall not be put to death for their children, and children shall not be put to death for their parents' crimes. A person shall be put to death only for what they themselves do. The prophet Ezekiel, who we read today, goes even further. He extends this teaching from simply human punishment, from the punishment of the court to divine retribution, declaring that even God doesn't commit the act of intergenerational blame, that such blame would be unethical. The Talmud goes on to affirm this. Our tradition is clear. One is not held responsible for the crimes of their parents or those who came before. Yet today, many jump to offer an apology. Oftentimes, it's out of fear. Fear of the public mob rather than they really regret what they did. And here we find a case where those apologizing didn't even do anything wrong. It's simply for PR. It's to protect in advance against a society willing to cancel anyone who made a mistake, or even those with a distant connection to somebody who did. The girl in the joke asks, why should she apologize that her friend's pet died? She didn't kill it. Or as Oppenheimer asks, why should they apologize? Because they had the bad luck to be descended from an anti-Semite? Almost all Gentiles, if you look far enough up the family tree, are descended from anti-Semites. I would take that a step further. If you look far enough up anybody's family tree, you will likely find someone who did something not just bad, but oftentimes rather awful. There are statements in Jewish texts I find offensive, ideas that at times shock me by the fact that our ancestors held them, beliefs that are xenophobic, misogynistic, homophobic, and more. But I didn't make them. You didn't make them. 
Are we to be held responsible for what someone who lived before us thought? Yesterday, for example, was Christmas, and along with it, the little-known Jewish holiday of Nidlnacht. Although if you saw my discussion with Rabbi Grover this week, you learned a lot about it. This holiday is a folk tradition that forbids Torah study, lest Jesus be given merit for it. Its customs include staying in and playing cards, eating garlic to ward off the soul of Jesus or other demonic beings. And as a smaller tradition, there are many children who avoid using the washroom after being warned that Jesus might pull them in and take them away. It's a folk holiday. Its origins are based on superstition and the polemical book Toldot Yeshu. This book tells the story of Jesus in a highly satirical and highly unsophisticated manner. He is portrayed as a child of incest rather than virgin birth. As an adult rather than a preacher, he stole the ineffable name of God from the temple and made improper use of it until he was finally caught and sentenced to death as a blasphemer. And finally, Tolod Yeshu teaches that Judas buried Jesus' body in a cellar with chamber pots and excrement, hence where the idea of fear of toilets comes from. It contains some highly offensive ideas for the modern person. It clashes with our multicultural, with our interreligious sensibilities. And yet still, this year I was surprised when I saw article after article, post after post written by Jews apologizing for the content of this book. None of them wrote it. None of them observed the holiday. None of them were alive when it began. What responsibility do they bear for the creation of these beliefs that require an act of contrition? It's an apology without responsibility. It's for PR. It's a preemptive measure against anyone who might try to blame them for what others before them thought or did, events that are entirely beyond their control. Don't get me wrong. It is important to say we are sorry. Repentance, tshuva, are deeply Jewish values. We have books dedicated to the subject, chapters and chapters of law. We have rituals and holidays, an entire season dedicated to the theme of repentance. Judaism teaches that it is important to apologize, but that is the problem. When we say we are sorry and we aren't, it demeans the entire enterprise. It cheapens it. Headlines are filled with apologies from politicians, from celebrities and others who are not really sorry. Instead, they're really sorry that they got caught. There was an interesting article this week in the Wall Street Journal titled, COVID Has Killed the Apology. It details politician after politician issuing statements apologizing for violating the very guidelines that they promoted. The governor of California eating at a restaurant after telling others not to. The mayor of San Jose violating rules on indoor gathering. The mayor of Denver traveling by plane after telling others to stay home. Or particularly ironic, the mayor of Austin who recorded a video urging fellow Texans to stay home from his vacation at a resort in Mexico. I'm not arguing that we shouldn't apologize. And I'm sure that the American examples aren't alone. There are certainly examples we could find here in Canada and we could find from politicians and the like around the world. But I'm not arguing that we shouldn't apologize, only that when we do, we should mean it. On the one end of the spectrum are empty words, offered by those who are not sorry for what they did. On the other end of the spectrum are words offered, even if they're sincere, by those who've done nothing wrong. Both ends cheapen what it means to say we are sorry. Both make the act of sincere repentance more difficult to recognize and thereby more difficult to perform. When we offer apologies without responsibility, we fuel the societal fire that demands an apology or else threatens one's cancellation. We give in to the mob. It is dangerous because the result is not more who are truly sorry. The result is simply more insincerity. The Sfat Emmet comments that twice in the story of Joseph we see the brothers do tshuva. Twice we see repentance. But only once is it sincere. Only once is it meaningful. The first time, he says, was last week. 
Last week when the Torah tells us that the brothers said to each other, Alas, we are being punished on account of our brother, because we looked at his anguish yet paid no heed as he pleaded with us. That is why this distress came upon us. They are sorry, the Sfat Emmet teaches, but only out of fear of punishment. They're sorry for the consequences that their actions caused to them, not the consequence it had on the one they had wronged, not on Joseph's experience and pain. But now in our Parsha, the Sfat Emmet teaches that the brothers are truly sorry. They have done repentance out of love, not out of fear. And this, he says, is the only true form. Judaism has much to say about repentance, about saying, I'm sorry. And it is important to do it. But it is also important to mean it. One cannot possibly mean it when they aren't responsible. And requiring people to act as if they were, it doesn't help those who have been hurt in the past, and it does nothing to change the present. Instead, Judaism teaches us to recognize that the past has brought us to this moment, to embrace the present, and most of all, to envision a future. Joseph says to his brothers that it was their act which allowed him to not only save the Egyptians, but to also save them, and in doing so, to save the Jewish people. Joseph truly does not regret the past. He doesn't regret what his brothers did to him, because without the deeds of his brothers, he would not be who he is today. He is brother. Without his brothers, without what happened to them, without what they did to their brother. Joseph truly does not regret the past, because without the deeds of his brothers, he would not be who he is. His brothers don't regret what they did, because if not, they would be victims of the famine too. And most of all, none of us honestly wish that what they did to Joseph hadn't happened, because without the deeds of his brothers, the Jewish people, we would not exist. In philosophy, there's what they call the apology paradox. We say we are sorry for things in the past. Oftentimes, these are things that played an integral role in creating the present. To say that we are sorry for what our ancestors have done is sincere as to say we wish we were not who we were today. We wish the world was not what it is. And the truth is that the majority of the time, Despite the sins of ancestors, we prefer our existence and with the world that we've come to know to the one that could have been. The paradox is that our apology by definition is false. Tshuva doesn't ask us to apologize for the sins of our ancestors. It asks us to make just what is in our power to do. It asks us to rectify actions that we've taken, wrongs that we have committed, it asks us to look at our deeds in a larger picture and work towards a future where the good we've done outweighs the bad. The Sfat Emmet, in his closing comment on our Parsha, focuses on this understanding. Tshuva, he says, true tshuva transforms. It changes the act by placing it in a larger context, morphing what was bad into a force for good. Tshuva is done through deed not empty words. It's a great topic for sermons around the high holidays, but I don't think we talk about it enough, at least not real tshuva. We are human. We will make mistakes. We will do things wrong. I, myself, have made far too many mistakes to spend my time apologizing for the mistakes of others. And there are far too many wrongs in the world for me to waste time listening to empty words. I don't need or want someone to apologize to me for what someone generations back did to my ancestors generations back. And I don't accept responsibility for what my ancestors may have done to others. Neither should you. There is real work to be done. The world is far from perfect. Our tradition demands that we work towards justice, towards righting what is wrong. Tshuva offers us a path to fix those mistakes, but that path can get lost amongst false ones. 
Let us stop tolerating empty words and empty apologies. Let us actually mean it when we say we are sorry. Shabbat Shalom.